I am Forrest Frosty Crummel, the Transitional Minister of St. Paul United Church of Christ in Pekin, Illinois, welcoming you to this online, this virtual worship service, wherever you may be and whenever you may be watching this time. We, it is our hope and prayer that you will be blessed by our time together and find spiritual food for your soul. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was happy when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Would you join me in a morning prayer? Our Lord God, we are thankful for this new day that you have given to us, for the sun that reminds us of the light of Jesus Christ in our lives, for its warm rays that remind us of the warmth of your love, for the breezes that remind us of the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and for the evening when the moon and the stars rise above in the sky, that it reminds us of your watchful eye as we rest when our day's work comes to an end. In this time of worship together, we ask that you be with us open our hearts and our minds so that we may be able to receive your word, that its seed of truth may be planted in our own lives, and that we might produce the fruit of your kingdom. In Christ's name we very humbly pray. Amen.
If we say that we do not have sin, we are deceiving only ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, then God, who is faithful, will restore us into our broken relationships and renew us. Friends, let us confess our sins with penitent hearts, confident that God will restore us in our broken relationships. Join me in the spirit of prayer. Our Lord God, we bow before you, conscious of the fact that we are far from perfect. We confess that we are held in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. For we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we ask that you have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and follow in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. It is the psalmist who reminds us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, that is how far God removes our sin from us. And as far as the east is from the west, that is how far God removes our transgressions. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament, from the book of 1 Samuel. Listen now to these words as they apply to our own lives and situations. From the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him, meaning Goliath, for your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defiled the armies of the Lord. And David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a, a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. And then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give you your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And th that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. 
When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. May God add understanding to the reading of that word. Amen. In his book, Slain Giants, Malcolm Gladwell describes the scene of the battle of David and Goliath in these terms. At the heart of ancient Palestine, there is a region known as Sephla, a series of ridges and valleys connecting the Judean mountains to the east with the wide, flat expanse of the Mediterranean plain. It is an area of breathtaking beauty and home to vineyards and wheat fields and forests of sycamore. It is also an area of great strategic significance. Over the centuries, numerous battles have been fought from the Mediterranean plain to those coasts near the cities of Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and the Judean highlands. The most storied valley is Elah. It is where Saladin faced off against the Knights of the Crusades in the 12th century. It played a central role in the Maccabean Wars with Syria more than a thousand years before that. And most famously during the days of the Old Testament, it is where the fledging kingdom of Israel squared off against the armies of the Philistines. It is in this valley that David met Goliath. I can invite you to consider what happens when ordinary people confront giants, whether those giants are armies, circumstances, or challenges in life. Gladwell noted that more often than not, giants are not what we think they are, and that their greatest strength is in reality frequently their greatest weaknesses. Maybe that is what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote to the Corinthians, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the sight of God. The story of David and Goliath encourages us, I believe, to think outside of the proverbial box, to creatively use the gray matter that God has placed between our ears, to be, as Jesus once said to his disciples, as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. Accordingly, let us allow our creative juices to flow. The armies of the Israel and the Philistines were at a standstill. The valley between the armies was a kind of no man's land. The Philistines challenged what is called a single combat. In single combat, each side chooses a warrior to represent them and the two warriors would then fight to the death with the winner take all. Single combat avoided the carnage and the killing that an all-out hand-to-hand battle might cause or would cause. Israel had no warrior who could stand up to Goliath and hope to win. Or maybe they did. Young David was sent to the front lines to give supplies to his brothers, heard Goliath issue a challenge day after day, and cursed the God of the Israelites. It was by God's grace that this shepherd boy stepped forward a boy who had not been trained as a warrior, but who had been anointed by Samuel to be the successor to Saul. David, you may remember, was the youngest of Jesse's sons. In the ancient world, there were three kinds of soldiers. There was the cavalry, the infantry, and a group called the slingers. According to the Old Testament book of Judges, a slinger could hurl a stone at a, the length of a football field and hit a hare. So accurate was their aim. 
David was a slinger. He was, in our modern parlance, a sharpshooter. He came to King Saul and said, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear would come and take a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. Your servant has killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. Then he added, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will also save me from this Philistine. As you recall, Saul tried to give David his armor, but David found it to be too cumbersome. He could not walk in it. There is a lesson for us to take away from here. We cannot be somebody else. God created us to be who we are, whether it be an individual or a congregation. We have our own gifts and talents. We can't borrow from someone else. We cannot be someone else. I once read that no one has all the spiritual gifts, but that everyone and every church has all the spiritual gifts that are necessary to do the ministry that they are called to do in their particular time, in their particular place. And so it was with David. He could not wear Saul's armor, but he could pick up five smooth stones and put them in his pouch and take his slingshot into battle. Although he did not know it at the time, as soon as David stepped onto the field, Goliath did not stand a chance. Now to say that Goliath was surprised at seeing this young David come forward to do battle with him would, would be a, an understatement. He expected to be facing some battle-hardened warrior similar to himself. He was all prepared to go all mano y mano, hand to hand. But David, thinking outside the box, changed the game, changed the paradigm. He was going to fight Goliath the same way that he fought lions and bears, as a projectile warrior. Picture the scene in your mind's eye. David runs toward Goliath with his leather sling and five smooth stones. Without the heavy armor, David had both speed and maneuverability. And taking a rock out of his pouch and putting it in the sling, he began to twirl it over his head and he launched the first stone. It hit Goliath below the helmet line, right between the eyes. And the velocity of the stone would have been like getting hit in the head with a baseball thrown by a major league pitcher. Goliath went down. The battle was over. David di did what he said he was going to do. He took home a trophy. When Jesus told his disciples that those who would take him seriously would need to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, he didn't mean that they should be na as naive as Little Red Riding Hood. No, he meant that the church of Jesus Christ needs to be sharp-eyed, world-wise, quick-witted. After all, Jesus sent his disciples into the world as sheep among wolves, and he needed them to be sharp sheep innocent people. One of my favorite writers is Frederick Beekner. In one of his books, he wrote, may be up to their, we may be up to our necks in muck, but the mark of innocence is that the muck never seems to stick. Things may be rotten all around, but there is a curious freshness even when, like the disciple Peter, we are guilty of tragic flaws and failures, there's still some inner purity that remains untouched. We live in a world and a time when news may be fake or not. Reality is oftentimes a matter of opinion. 
certainties that were previously accepted are now questioned, and rights take precedent more often than not over responsibilities. Heroes are called cowards, and truth is up for grabs. None of this is new. It has always been this way. But the challenges that we face in the beginning of the 21st century look like a Goliath to us. They look too big to defeat. Accordingly, it is easy for us to become discouraged and try to protect what we have. And by protecting what we have, we become smaller as we circle the wagons. But if we, like David, remember who we are, that we are baptized, adopted children of the creator of the universe, all that was and is and ever will be, we need not be afraid. We simply need to pull up our big boy or big girl pants and meet today's challenges as bravely and as boldly as David met Goliath thousands of years ago. You see, we are called to be slingers, not necessarily warriors. We are called to assess our strengths and our assets and to remind ourselves that God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but rather a spirit of power and love and sound judgment and personal discipline. The ability to remain calm and well balanced in the midst of difficulty. In other words, we are called to step out boldly confident of the promise of the resurrection. The world in which we live begs for fresh approaches to new realities. The world in which we live begs for, longs for, the church of Jesus Christ to be the body of Christ here on earth. To God be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? Our Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit might search our hearts and our minds, that you would take our moans and our groans and our broken words and hear them as they are meant to be, as we lift up our joys and our concerns our worries and our troubles. We ask that you give us a vision that sees beyond this world of sight and sound and a faith and a trust that we can see things differently, that we can be given the strength and the courage and the wisdom to approach old problems in new ways. We pray for ourselves and our households, for those whom we love, as well as for those from whom we are estranged. Answer all of our various and sundry prayers according to your will, but more importantly, Lord, make us perceptive to your will as we go about the living of our own lives. It is in Christ's name that we humbly pray. Amen. My name is Mark Street, and this song is His Eye is on the Sparrow.
May the love of God that will never let you go, the peace of Christ that passes all human understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that knits us together as the body of Christ here on earth be with you every day of your life. Amen.